Anybody? Ah, we do have some. Okay, so I, as a uh, as an incentive here, okay, we now have <laughs> gold stars. Okay. So here's how it works. Here's how it works. You bring in the main pack. You answer a question, you get a gold star. And you can accumulate these. And you can decorate your thing up however you like. And at the end of the year, there is a prize. And it'll be, it'll be worth well. Trust me, I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> so I'm not going to disrupt. So, so Sabi's going to do the ground penetrating radar. And that makes kind of natural sense because it follows very nicely the understanding inside the organization. You can think about weighing things, reflective, practice, and stuff like that. So that makes a nice unit. I'm going to pick it up at, after that for the DC sensitivity and the electromagnetics and the utilization. In the meantime, my job is simply to uh, put start on your. Uh, it's with it back to the webcam. Hi guys. Um, so uh, we're going to switch our topic to uh, ground centering radar, GPR. Um, was there any question about seismic? No. Perfect. We got one more lab, so I think uh, today in the lab we're going to go through like an A to Z or uh, how we do uh, like a seismic reflection processing, but the like uh, for this course, we're done. We're done with it. Now we're moving to uh, ground penetrating radar. Okay. You're still a webcam. Uh, yeah. Well. Um, not sure. I think that maybe it's a problem with my machine. Um, yeah, I, I think Do you want to try my machine? Uh, uh, while we're connecting it, then uh, what, what is this equation? Have you, have you guys seen this equation before? Is there any volunteer? Well, we're getting a gold star. What is that? What is this? What is the name of this equation? Okay, so we're always. Uh, has anybody ever seen this guy? Great gradient. This, this is a gradient operator, and then this thing here. Yeah, it's, that's the curl operator. Does that sound familiar? No. Okay. So curls, curls are something that go like this. They're like in your bathtub, right? So if you open your bathtub drain. And the water circulates around; it's curling around. So that's that's the first thing you need to need, need to think about. You you know this thing here kind of means that you know something's kind of curling curling around. The other thing, if you have something like di di t, this thing here, does that ring a bell with anybody? Or d d t. This is a time derivative. So this is telling you how much things change in time. So, well, they're still jiggling around. If we look at this, what this means in words, if you have ever anything that looks like this, so I'm going to take you through this in, 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 in a second. On the right hand side, you've got something that's a field, it's age, and it's varying in time. So it means this, this is changing in time. And 
And what does that mean? That's that's an equation, so something is changing in time, and that's going to give rise to a curl of, of something else. And that's how you can think about these equations without, you can almost kind of visualize them in, in words. And uh, so I'm going to take you through, and I'll put up both stars. <laughs> Um, anyway, so was there any answer? What is this equation? What is the equation for an electromagnetic wave? Carter? Yeah, no clue. <laughs> that was like three years ago. Wow. Uh, Kyle? No. Same vote as Carter. Where's my physics students? Uh, there we go. Uh, Alan. Alan. I don't know. No? <laughs> Whoa! I don't know. Okay, uh, anyway, that's a Maxwell's, uh, Maxwell's equation, and that, that explains the electromagnetic wave propagation. We're, we're going to, yeah, we're going to go through that later, but that was just that was a question. But the technique uh, called Gromsky three radar actually is governed by this equation. It's a little bit aggressive, but it's meaningful, and there's a, and there's a beauty, so I'm going to tell you later. So, yeah, well, like it's a typical template that we're usually doing, so we're going to introduce what is this, what is this technique. Physical property, so remember in seismic, the P wave velocity was, the, or S wave velocity was physical property. But we're still doing the same thing, but we're using different physics, meaning where we have a different physical property. And the basic principle, what is the physics? What are the data? Okay, we're going to do this GPR survey, then what is the data? And how we process data, how we interpret it. So that's the template that we used to use for other uh, geophysical methodologies, which is basically the same. And uh, here I'm starting with Maxwell's equation. So as I said, this explains the uh, Electromagnetic wave propagation. Okay. So it looks complicated, but that's not very far from our life. Well, think about your cell phones. How you transmit the your yeah, your signal, electrical signal, to uh, a satellite or ion sphere, and then back to somebody else. So that's actually using the electromagnetic. How many times you use the microwave? <laughs> oh, perfect. I mean, yeah, I'm not using that much, but the uh, yeah. But anyway, so it's very, it's a very fundamental equation. But what's cool, it's just a few equation, but it really explains all the physics that we're really using. And uh, what I'm going to do, so the first one is the Faraday's law. So what it tells you, as Doug mentioned, is the like a this sign is the curl. But anyway, it's a, some sort of derivative in space, okay? how, how it's changing in space. But the B is the magnetic field, and time variant magnetic fields generate the electrical field. So that's why it is. If you don't understand, that's okay. I'm just kind of like going to be a little bit quick here. But uh, we'll use this equation later as well in other methodologies. So I want to kind of introduce what it is. And then the second equation, basically if you got a current, J. So let's say you got a current element like this. And then there will be a magnetic field in rotating direction. Got a current like this. And then by coupling this equation, we can. Uh, what's, the question? what's your name? Andy. Andy. So the curl part of the electric that is the magnetic Perfect, yeah. So what that means, so the V, dBdt, that's the source. Okay? So if you got a time run magnetic field, then it will generate the electric, so if there's a time run magnetic field in this direction, it will generate the rotating electric field. Okay. So curl is actually like, a, it's like a rotating, rotating field. It generates a rotating field. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so those are the equations, and then we can couple this. Okay. So by coupling this, we can have an equation like this. So curl, curl of E is uh, um, non sigma. Um, uh, 
So, for this given equation, yeah, by rearranging this, you can have uh, these equations. Okay? And what's, uh, what's an interesting thing is just this one is a diffusive term. Okay? So, it's like a in kind of uh, diffusing in the water. So, that diffusing term. And this is the wave term. This is the diffusion. And that's a wave. So wave, we learn this, right? What kind of wave did we learn? Arno? No. Well, we learned. Wow. We learned a wave with well, the previous lecture. <laughs> oh, getting frustrated, but uh, yeah, perfect. So we. Well, so, so that's, that's, uh, that's a star, or I'm not sure. I it's uh, like a half star. <laughs> <laughs> you, you tell me when, because I'm just in the back. Here. I'm pretty positive. You can give me a star. Uh, I fought all the way on. Ah, well, that was. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so we learned a wave term, right? Like seismic wave. So this term, basically same as it's very similar to seismic wave, but that's like a kind of it, it explains how a wave propagates. And these two terms is basically same as one over c squared, and that's actually equal to mu naught epsilon naught. Do you know what the c squared is? Just guess. Speed of light. Perfect. Yes, yeah, speed of light. So c is the speed of light. And uh, C is equal to root mu naught so naught. And anyone knows the velocity, like a uh, speed of light value? Okay. So that actually explains how speed of light kind of actually propagates if you're ignoring this term. But those two things are happening together. So this diffusion and wave propagation happening together, and we can explain that by using this couple of equations, which is actually cool. And uh, what we're going to focus on is this one. So our physical property is this guy. I'm going to introduce to you later, but it's called dial dielectric constant. I'm going to introduce what that is later, but that's, uh, that's what we're going to focus on. So if there's a different material having different dielectric constant, we can potentially see that. It's because we're seeing the physical property contrast with the geophysical technology. And I'm going to show you a movie of, uh, so here's where we, have, we got some EM source. <coughs> Thinking about, it's like an antenna, right? It's like your cell phone. Right? So you got an antenna, and then it will transmit the EM energy. Right? Like a pulse, like a Remember the seismic pulse, uh, like kind of looking like this. So it'll generate the pulse, and then that will propagate, and it will hit this guy. Right. So it's in the air. So it'll first hit the interface between the surface, like the air and the soil, and then it, it will go down to this target, like a pipe. Okay. So take a look what's happening. It's propagating. Hits the target, coming back, and reaches to the receiver antenna. Right. So that's what's happening in the Earth when we're transmitting the EM energy that propagates down to the like pipe and then gets back. And we can see that we can measure that on the receiver location. Right. So that's very similar to seismic, right? It's almost like the physics is a bit different. But how you're going to interpret the data is going to be almost the same as uh, seismic. But the scale is different, right? Think about the, uh, do you remember what was the, like a P wave velocity for uh, like alluvium? It was a couple hundred meter per second, right? But what is the velocity of the light? Way, way faster, right? So what you're going to see is much quicker. That means you're going to see kind of very near surface compared to the seismic. 
So that's a bit of difference. But there are a lot of analogies in GPR with seismic. So think about what we learned seismic when, when, while I'm going through uh, this uh, lecture. And uh, GPR, it's an it's a EM method. EM stands for electromagnetics. So any EM method is actually governed by this Maxwell's equation. And the member of the physical property was actually three. One is the, this guy, which is dielectric constant. And sigma is an electrical conductivity. Has anybody knows what is electrical conductivity? In general, yes. Yeah. The transfer by direct contact. Ah, uh, can you tell me again what was it? Transfer of energy by convection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's more sophisticated uh, explanation, but basically how well current flows in the medium. I think that determines the electrical conductivity that we have. And that's uh, the current well is high conductivity. Or not like a low conductivity. And uh, this one, we learned this. Uh, it's a magnetic permeability. We learned this, right? That was one of the property for magnetics. Okay. And uh, as I said, it actually used much higher frequency compared to seismic. It was about 100 hertz or 60 hertz, your uh, kind of base frequency. But this one is actually a couple megahertz to gigahertz. So it's actually using much higher frequency. And then we're seeing much shallower part of the Earth, like the mm -hmm. meter. Okay. But other than that, it's quite similar to seismic. And this is sort of the setup, right? Like this is the transmitter and the receiver. The EM wave will propagate and reflect and refract in the Earth, and we can measure that at the receiver location here. And uh, I'm going to tell you later, but the, how the survey works is uh, you got trans one transmitter receiver, right? It transmits and then get the response response from like the Earth, and probably at this location mostly. Then I'm moving, 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 moving. So if I'm moving, like if I'm sweeping a whole this line, I'm going to get the data looks like this. We're going to call this as a radio radio uh, radiogram as like a seismogram. So that's kind of your, how your data looks like. You can see there's some layering, some hyperbola. We're not sure what that is now, but I'm going to explain that, what it is later. And what are the applications of GPR? Uh, like a mapping pit thickness. So it can be used for agricultural use. Right? If there's some dielectric constant, contrast in the soil, or in the water, or a saturated part, we can actually see that right with GPR. But that's very shallow. Or glaciers, right? where's the thing that the glacier? We want to know that. And a lot of geotechnical problems. Maybe you guys are really interested. Where are like what where are my pipes? Right? We're supposed to know, but sometimes actually we don't really know where, where they are. And then the given information sometimes not quite correct. One of the big issues that can, I'm, I'm from South Korea, and like a couple of years ago, there's a big, big cavity at the center of the, at the center of Seoul. Like there are millions of people living in there, lots of cars, but in that center, there's a like really big cavity about this size. And they were actually using GPR to find that. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so those are the applications, and uh, if you want to know actually more about what applications we have using GPR, uh, this is actually a good link. Sensorsoft, it's a company uh, generating GPR equipment, and they, sometimes they do a survey as well, but it's a good link to, uh, good resources to uh, know more about what, what this technique is. Yeah, so I'm going to move on to physical property now. So that was an intro about that GPR uh, methodology is. Yeah, so I'm going to like uh, introduce three uh, different physical properties. First one is dielectric permittivity. Okay. This one is like uh, actually a tough one, but uh, if you think about the water, 
It's polarized. Okay. So H2O has like a, essentially a polarized material. And it has some uh, negatives and uh, positive sign. Those are water molecules, for instance. Let's suppose that actually have a, a plus and minus sign. And when I'm applying the electrical field, it can be oriented in the direction of the electrical field. So dielectric constant or dielectric permittivity, how well it can be oriented in, in that, that direction, applied electrical field direction. So it's kind of similar to magnetization. We sometimes we call this as a polarization, but uh, if you if you can really easily polarize, you're going to get high dielectric constant. And electrical conductivity, as I said, is how easily uh, charges are moving, how we can easily conduct the currents in in the, in the material. Right? So, for instance, metal have really large uh, conductivity. How about the insulator? Do you, do you know any insulator like? Uh, very really low conductivity. Is there any material? Wood, no. plastic. Yeah, wood, plastic, or rubber could be a, a big insulator. It may not want to conduct the currents. Magnetic permeability. I think I don't really need to explain this, right? So we've learned this before. But those are three important physical properties which kind of uh, can affect our GPR measurements. The most important thing is also, but the this one, dielectric permittivity. Okay, that's the that's the main physical property that we're going to take care of. But sometimes others are important as well. Okay. But this one is the first one. Okay. Yeah. And uh, water, as I said, is very sensitive to dielectric constants. Like a usual material, this epsilon uh, r, that's a relative permittivity, but it's usually one. But water has eight. So it's actually 80 stronger compared to usual earth materials. So it's actually huge. There's a huge contrast. So definitely, if you want to find some water, you can use that. Right? And uh, like I said, they do have a different impact to the signal, but we're going to get there how, what kind of impact each property can uh, put in in our signal. So I'm going to just introduce a couple of terminologies. So we're going to define, so epsilon is a dielectric permittivity. But, uh, and if you look at this number, it's kind of like complicated, hence the minus 12, 8.854. So we're going to just define a simple val simpler value by using a, a ratio between uh, the actual dielectric permittivity divided by epsilon uh, mod which is uh, in the vacuum space. So that's, uh, that's a relative permittivity. Okay? That's how we're going to do it. Same as mu, uh, like, uh, permeability, magnetic permeability, divided by mu naught. Okay? So that's a definition. Okay. And most of the original material might be have uh, like around one. And those are the values. Okay. So this is a table of uh, a relative uh, permittivity. Okay. If you look at the water, that's 80. <coughs> Other things are not quite that big. Right? The dry sand is 3 to 5. Okay. And there's an electrical conductivity. The seawater is huge, right? the 3,000 millisiemens per meter. <coughs> and it's a uh, given velocity. So here, 0.3 meter per nanosecond is the speed of light. Okay? So you can convert that by using this equation. Right. Remember, the speed of light was 3 multiplied by 10 to 8. If you convert that into nanos, uh, nano, a, mil, a meter per nanosecond, it will be 0.3 uh, meter per nanosecond. Okay. So that, those are the units that we're going to use when we're introducing uh, velocity of like GPR or uh, velocity of EM wave. Okay. Good. Any any question so far? Okay. So I'm going to move on. Um, 
uh, who is it like an everyday using uh, microwave? Joshua. So I'm going to introduce, do you know how it works? Microwaves? Yeah, can you, can you tell me how it works? Okay, so you've got your microwaves. Uh -huh. um, and then they're floating around for your little microwave oven. And okay. they're exciting all of your water uh, molecules yeah. in the food. Right. Because water is special like that. So yeah. then you've got all your water molecules bouncing around. Uh -huh. And then that frictional heat that they cause is yeah. heating up your food. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I think you can get two goals. Sure. Right. Yeah. 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 That's almost perfect. So, so Joshua, what's the, what's the physical property that we actually that makes that heat, right? Like the like, like friction? No, no. Like what is the property of the water that, that make it happen, right? Oh, it's dielectric permanent. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So dielectric like permanent. Yeah. So that's so what uh, Yes, yeah, so Joshua already explains, so I don't really need to really explain, but I'm just going to uh, do a, like a little bit in detail. So this is the, you can think that as like a, a transmitter, right? So it emits all this electromagnetic wave, a whole bunch of different directions. And this one is actually, this block is sealed with the, with the metal, metal. So it's actually high, really high conducting metal, so it actually reflects. There's no energy transmitting into the box, which we want, right? And then plastic is almost like, a, it doesn't really matter. And then it hits the target for our food. That's what's happening. And the important thing is here, microwave is really high frequency. It's at 2.4 gigahertz. That means it vibrates really fast. And uh, if you think about the wavelength of that, is about 12 centimeters. Yeah, and then as uh, Joshua explained, it, that electromagnetic and electromagnetic energy can be observed in, in, in the body or in the target. But what's important thing is uh, it has a resonant frequency. Of, so we're emitting that resonant frequency that the water has. That's actually about 2.5 gigahertz. So that, that way, water can be really excited because it has high dielectric permittivity. And that's how that energy can be turned into a kinetic energy. Uh, that kinetic energy can be turned into like a hit. So that's how we can actually hit that. The same principle can be applied to to this GPR, right? So that's uh, so we need we, if you have something, some material have high dielectric constant, they can be really excited. So we can get energy, get that energy. From the, from the surface. So that's the idea of GPR. And uh, how EM wave propagates is actually interesting, like look at this. So there is, uh, it's not just a single value or single, single field. So there's both electrical and magnetic field, right? Which is actually transverse, like an orbicular. And then that's the direction of the wave that they are propagated and oscillating like this. So when that uh, microwave em emits the energy, both E and <coughs> electrical and magnetic fields propagate. And what's happening in the wa water molecule, that looks like that. So that's a sort of natural state. And when we're putting the electromagnetic energy or electrical field, so they rotate. They, they're going to be reoriented in the direction of the electrical. And uh, now that was the physics, and let's actually look at this uh, movie. It's basically the same movie. And uh, remember that we're putting uh, some sort of a waveform. So this is where we're putting the energy looks like this in time. So that's, uh, it's very similar to seismic. So that's the waveform. And then it's actually started up here. And it propagates. And it hits the, a pipe. So let's suppose this pipe is very conductive. It's like a metal pipe, right? And see what's happening in the pipe. There's nothing, right? So it's, it's, it's decayed. Right? So that means if you got really high conductivity, that EM wave actually kind of decays a lot. But anyway, there's a reflection, and then we can see that probably on the surface. 
And uh, to define that wave propagation, uh, we need to know what is the velocity. Velocity, well, we, know, we knew velocity of light here, right? but there are other terms, right, here, if you, if you go back. So there's probably other things can affect the velocity of the light, or the velocity of the EM weight. And uh, it's kind of complicated, but that looks like this. Okay? So uh, I haven't defined yet about W. So W is 2 pi, it's an angular frequency. The frequency, if you think about the unit, is 1 over second. So you can just simply think that as an inverse of time. Okay. So like a large time means a low, low frequency. And then, so, okay, what is the velocity here? And what is the, like a velocity is a function of frequency, okay, W, and the conductivity. Uh, electric constant and uh, uh, magnetic permeability. So that makes sense, right? But it's kind of confusing. It's a function of time, right? Because, okay, at different time, my velocity is different. We're not going to go there, but that's the reality. But we're, we're going to assume that that term, that term is actually pretty minor. So at a certain point, we always got the same velocity. That's the assumption that we're going to use. So that's where we're making that assumption. So let's suppose this two product of W multiplied by dielectric permittivity is big enough compared to conductivity. We can basically ignore this term, this diffusion term. So we just have this wave term. So we can assume, okay, there's no diffusion happening, but it's, it's actually perfectly like a wave. So that's the assumption that we're making. Then then we can have this equation, V is equal to C divided by root epsilon R. Okay. That makes sense, right? Like uh, the velocity of light was looks like this. Okay. And then if you ignore that guy, mu R was one, and we can have we can be it can be like this. So now our velocity is only a function of uh, relative permittivity. Right? So what happens if you got large Electrical permittivity, velocity increases or decreases? Beta? Mm -hmm. We got large dielectric permittivity or a relative dielectric permittivity. What happens to your velocity? Oh, it's given here. Perfect. So let's say, remember, the water has high, like a high dielectric permittivity, that means it has lower velocity. Let's say compared to the air. And those are the tables. Okay. So for a given uh, material, what are the velocities? What are the uh, relative uh, permittivity? But what's uh, interesting thing is this two guy. Look at this distilled water and the seawater. Their dielectric permittivity is basically the same as A <coughs> okay? But their conductivity is quite different. And now their velocity is actually different. So that means velocity is also a function of conductivity. But we're at, at the moment, we're simply ignoring it. But in reality, that's actually a function. Okay? So that can affect. So we, we sometimes we actually need this full equation to figure out what's the actual velocity of the material, okay? But uh, at the moment, we're not gonna go there, okay? So we're gonna assume V is like this. It's only a function of the dielectric permittivity, okay? So we're gonna ignore the conductivity if that's in the middle, okay? So, <laughs> So, okay, uh, 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 sorry about that. Uh, so <laughs> we're not going to ignore the conductivity effects. We're, we're going to take care of the conductivity effects. Sorry. Yeah, okay. So the idea was, uh, yeah, so we, we got, okay. <laughs> so there, there, it, actually, conductivity makes an impact to your velocity. Right? So let's take care of that, what's actually happening. But the, at the end of the day, when we're processing it, uh, we're, we're going to ignore it. But the, 
this is a physics part, so I'm going to take care of what that is. So let's suppose uh, I'm, uh, I'm storing an energy from uh, Z0, and that uh, amplitude is A, not. Okay. And at one point, it goes to one, I don't, I'm not sure one meter, what, anyway, distance one, and it'll decay because of the diffusion. The conductivity actually make we're losing the energy, right? We're losing the hit. So um, like that will make a decay or attenuation. And uh, so at uh, value one, we're going to have a. And that will look like this. So all like a, if we got really big alpha, that means we're going to decay a lot. Or if you got a smaller alpha, it may not be that much. And uh, what that alpha is, is actually very similar to velocity, but uh, that looks like this. And then if you're, if you're making some assumption, let's suppose, okay, this term is dominant, or that term is dominant. So that's actually this two case. So let's suppose this conduction or diffusion term was dominant. That alpha just looks like this. So now it's a how it attenuates is a function of conductivity. Okay? So if you've got large conductivity, it attenuates more. So that's what it actually tells us. Uh, and then this case, when this guy is dominant, that looks like that. It's still a function of conductivity. So if you've got large conductivity, it attenuates more. It's, 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 but here, uh, epsilon also can play a role. That's uh, how the wave attenuates because of the like this diffusion term. And uh, if you are uh, ignoring this wave term, we call this as uh, a quasi-static. So it's a uh, it's, it's, it's literally what it is. It's almost like a static problem. So that's why you call it quasi-static, and then there's no wave propagation. So that's the assumption. Or if you ignore this terminology, and now we're in the wave domain. And I think the one we're going to use is mostly this wave domain, this GPR. Is that, is that okay? Is that kind of clear? What the uh, kind of, can you describe the relationship between alpha and velocity? Um, good question. Um, so, uh, if you think about like a, what we actually in put it in is actually it's a function of time as well. And then you're like a if you take the derivative in terms of t, then actually you can come up with what is the velocity here. Uh, so let's say um, like that. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm a little bit lost, but I think it's, uh, it's like an inverse of alpha. I'll, uh, I'll like a consolidate it later. But uh, I think it, there's an inverse of much. So it's, like, it's almost uh, actually the same. But uh, um, I think it's velocity of the proxy for alpha. Is it fair to say that alpha is equal to the velocity roughly? Um, what was your question? Sorry, what was your comment? Um, can you, is it fair to say that alpha is roughly equal to the velocity, or that like the velocity is a proxy for alpha? It's based on the experience of alpha is equal to the velocity. Um, I think that I guess it's a one over alpha is equal to velocity. I guess. Oh, okay, I see. Because uh, well, the, the point that I wanted to make here, if you take the derivative here, so what is the velocity is. Uh, like a meter per second, and then the definition of velocity delta t and delta z. So uh, you can come up with okay, it's a from inverse uh, inverse of that. Yeah.
And that was an important point because, uh, like, uh, this uh, uh, process related to both velocity and attenuation. Okay, was there any, any other question here? For the equation going to the basic equation, is that Euler's number? Is that the equation? Uh, pardon? It's like on the board behind you, the first equation in the top left. This one? Yeah, is that the is that Euler's number? Uh, no, this is electrical. <coughs> okay, so different things. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, that's different. Things. Sorry about that. So this is electrical field. So I just put a vector here. Uh, so that E is Euler's number, uh, two point seven. Okay, so we talked about velocity and the attenuation. And in both cases, actually, conductivity plays, plays a role. And more importantly, in the attenuation, conductivity plays a big role. Right? You got a large conductivity, wave attenuates more. Right, so that's, we're back to that table. And now I think we can sort of understand why uh, why this was actually different velocity. So that that's because of the different conductivity. And there are other, there are there are other materials like pretty conductive like clays. Clays can be pretty conductive. Seawater is conductive. So in that case, we might see a lot of waves really attenuated. And Sometimes we need to, like, okay, how much wave is attenuated? We need some number, right? Okay, for a given conductivity, how much my wave is going to be attenuated? So that's, uh, for that, we need to define this uh, concept called skin and depth. And then if you're assuming, so let's, what it actually means, um, remember this ratio, this was, this was the initial amplitude, and at some point in that, that's A. And that's what we want. And that skin depth is when uh, this alpha is 1. So wave is attenuated by this much. So it's about 37%. So if you divide by 1, 1 yeah, yeah, 1.3. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for two different regimes, remember we got the quasi static regime and the wave regime. You can get different definition of skin depth. So skin depth is how much amplitude is decayed. And it's actually I'm not sure, but it's actually good to remember it. And because like okay, for a given frequency, let's say I got 100 hertz, and my conductivity is 0.01. And how much my wave is decayed is about 500. Uh, okay, 500. So, like, how much wave is decayed by this much? It's about 500. That's that's skin depth. So, if you got uh, high conductivity, and is it skin depth increases or decreases? Chelsea. Oh, it's given here. Uh, um, you got high conductivity. So then it'll decrease. And how about high frequency? Right. So what that like can you can you tell me what that means? If you're in a really conductive media. Yeah, so then I guess the D value again. Uh the D value? Uh, this one? Uh, skin depth. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So then, you're deeper. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, no, no, like you, you already answered the question. So if you got, say, high conductivity, if you're going to get smaller skin depths, that means your wave is much more attenuated. So smaller skin depths, that means, and then, like, like similarly, if you got higher frequency, wave will attenuate more. So if you're, let's say, you're using higher frequency band compared to lower frequency, your wave will be much more uh, attenuated. And then this uh, uh, terminology, skin depth, tells you about that. 
this is actually quite important concepts if you have a question um, now. So let's say you're somewhere with a lot of inductive material, would you not want to use EPR because uh, it would be attenuated a lot? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if your overall background is pretty conductive, then you may not, you may not want to use that. So question one, <laughs> so what happens to wave uh, amplitude as it propagates? What happens? Uh, Kai? What happens? Question one. Pardon? Oh, you don't know? Oh, come on. Well, we, we just talked about that, about the attenuation. So it'll decrease, right? <laughs> Not a star. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, how about the second question? What's the answer? <coughs> Lower. Who was it? Everyone. <laughs> I think there was a on the back. Lower. Perfect. What's your name? Anisha. Um, so what happens to skin depth at higher frequency? Higher the frequency, decrease the frequency. You can just talk. And uh, this is actually like, now we're almost like uh, done because uh, other things are quite similar. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the reflection coefficient. And do you remember what was the reflection coefficient in seismic? That was like Z1 minus Z2, uh, Z2 minus Z1. Right. So basically, it's the same same equation. You just need to turn that into a like a as a function of velocity, and then put the relative permittivity. Then you can get the, this equation. It's kind of switch it, right? But if you think about what is the definition of velocity or GPR, was an inverse of so, by using that, you can come up with this reflection coefficient. Okay. So that's the same phenomenon is happening. Reflection and transmission is happening, and then the physics is basically the same. Okay. So, like uh, we've already talked about, like if one medium is much larger, there will be a really large uh, uh, reflection. So there's <coughs> like, there's very small energy transmitted in, and vice versa. And uh, for a given uh, dielectric constant, or relative permittivity, we can come up with the reflection coefficient. Right? So this is an example, dry sand and limestone. It's about 0.1, 0.1, Dry sand and wet sand, 0.5. Why is that? Why are we having a large uh, reflection coefficient in this case? Yeah. If that's saturated, got more water, water has high relative permittivity. Correct? Yeah. Air and so air and seawater is huge, right? So what is the velocity of the air? Or EM weight? Remember that we are here. So that's really fast. And seawater is pretty low. What was the question? Isn't that too like, like the vacuum because that means that the Well, yeah, true. So, if, like, if there's some dust in the air, it may not be exactly the or not, but like it's it, it's pretty close, I guess. Yeah, and then, uh, but the. As the conductivity makes an impact to uh, how wave attenuates, it also makes actually impact to your reflection coefficient. But it, it's uh, it's like I remember that uh, microwave. We got a metal box, and what it actually does, it, it actually is, it acts as like a perfect reflect. So there is no energy transmitted in, but it actually reflects everything. 
Right? So here, if uh, we put, like if you assume sigma is infinity, it can be large, uh, then uh, velocity is zero. So there's no main propagation. So take a look at this one back. Now, there are two questions. So you can think about that. So what is, uh, what is the uh, epsilon one? So epsilon one is the background. Epsilon two is the pipe. And then epsilon two, like this pipe, is actually a, a, a almost perfect conductor. Can somebody tell me? There are two things uh, connected. The reflection coefficient was r with epsilon one minus To make R positive, what is the condition? So, one is two. So, positive reflection coefficient means uh, the reflected signal will have the same time, same wavelength. Right? But if that was not the case, if the reflection coefficient was negative, the sign of the poles will be changing when it's reflected. Right? So take a look. So it was blue and blue first and the red, right? And uh, what is reflected? Blue red. Right? So which one is bigger? Epsilon one, epsilon two. And what is the sign of the R in this case? I know it's positive because it's the same same sign. So E1 is bigger than E2. Um, oh no, I think this epsilon 1 was good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what is that? Okay. And then how about the conductor? Is that go through? No. No, this reflects. It's DK, right? But we can still get a reflection, right? So we can still see it. So that doesn't necessarily mean that a kind of perfect conductor we potentially see, it, right? but uh, below that or in the in that media, there's no wave. Actually, it's just decay. And uh, well, other things are also very similar, like reflection, Snell's law, right? critical reflection. So I'm not going to go through all the details here, but the it's basically same same principle. And the finally, I think, uh, well, we probably need to finalize that. Uh, but the, one more thing is scattering. So there, let's suppose there are a whole bunch of like the junks here, the fragments of things, and it, it'll make a scattering. So this is the movie. So look at this, how complicated they are. So if you measure a signal at receiver location, your signal will be like much more complicated compared to uh, like a simpler case. So if you have a scattering, we'll, we'll lose some signals from this uh, reflector here. It's hard, to, it's hard to see a really consistent signal from like a layering, for instance. So that scattering can be sometimes an issue. Yeah. I think that was it today. Any, any question? Thank you.